Welcome everyone to the 4IP Council's webinar um, with LESI. This webinar is called Green Tech Helping Net Zero Emissions by 2050. My name is Axel Frazzini. I'm the Managing Director of 4IP Council and I will be your host today. Okay. So as you may know, 4IP Council is a not-for-profit organization we are a research organization and we are focused on the link between intellectual property and innovation. To identify the most relevant topics and produce empirical research, we work closely with a wide variety of academics, experts, IP organizations and stakeholders. On our website, you can find a range of free materials uh, like studies, guidelines, summaries of relevant research papers and recordings of our webinars, like the one of today. Moreover, we produce easy to digest content, especially tailored for non-IP experts, SMEs and startups. This is free of charge as well. So some examples are interactive graphics and interviews of entrepreneurs to inspire the small companies, but also the big companies. With this, we aim to assist innovative startups and SMEs to learn how to use IP to grow their businesses. It seems uh, it is lagging, okay. Uh, as you know, more and more things are increasingly connected and uh, we have developed several tools for small companies, such as uh, the four SMEs infographics, that can be freely downloaded from the website where we cover trademarks, copyrights, design rights, patents, and trade secrets. We have also developed a very useful database collecting all the case law uh, decision summaries of court cases regarding the, the standard social patents decision in Europe. This section is now also available in Chinese and Japanese. So uh, feel free to spread the word. And if you are wondering if the 4IP website is only in English, I would say we have created a dedicated section in Chinese as well. So do not hesitate to also uh, communicate about this. But without further delay, it is really my pleasure today to have three great speakers. Uh, we have Dr. Surasha, Udam Sack, Dr. Dallas Wilkinson, and Dr. Stephanie Guichard that will be presenting different industries, but all converging to the same, uh, which is green tech and how green tech is helping a net zero emissions uh, by 2050. So let me introduce the, the profile and the bios of the different speakers. Uh, first, we have Dr. Surasha Damsak, who is currently the Chief Innovation Officer and Executive Vice President, New Business of SCG Chemicals. His primary responsibility is to lead Innovation and Technology Group to enhance competitive advantage and grow new business opportunities for SCGC. He is also specially assigned to steer sustainability development function which is important business principle for SCGC. Then we have Dr. Dallas Wilkinson, who is a customer-focused, strategic international leader, growing businesses and people by applying and commercializing technology. Dallas had over 30 years in the global mining services sector, gaining extensive international experience in roles spanning research and development, technology, sales, marketing, business management, general management, strategy, safety, risk, manufacturing, operations, business turnarounds, consultancy, and business startups. And we have Dr. Stephanie Guichard, who is an economic strategy director with Qualcomm, where she focuses on the economic, social, environmental impact of wireless technology. Before joining Qualcomm in 2021, Stephanie held economist roles in several organizations, including the OECD and the IMF. A final remark for the audience, please do not hesitate to post your question directly in the Q&A tool 
during the live discussion. And you can find this Q&A tool at, in the lower part of the screen. So raise your question and right after the presentation, we will take your questions. Each presenter will have 10 minutes and a set of slides have been pre uh, prepared. So let's get started. Thrasha, the floor is all yours. Yes, it's my pleasure to be in this panel discussion. I think today we, I would like to give you guys a glimpse of what's happening in the plastic manufacturing. This is a very important industry value chain. Next, please. So SCGC, we are the leader in the sustainable chemical innovation and manufacturing. We very much focus on the plastic. We have a company group revenue is about 7.5 billion US. And we have operation mostly in Southeast Asia, but we have do, we are doing a lot of innovation in Europe, mostly in Norway and United Kingdom. And for us, ESG environment, social government is a key principle of our business commitment. So we have a lot of targets covering both environment, social, and governance. Next, please. So for us, we, we are doing two things. First, we want to grow the green polymer, which is our kind of a cash name for our platform. So we target to achieve 1 million tons of a green polymer within 2030. And to give you in a context, right now we're producing polymer is about 3 million tons. So this is a very challenging thing. And I will explain you later what is a green polymer. Not, not only trying to make polymer that good for the environment, we also try to cut down on CO2 emission from our operation. So we have a strong target of getting it down 20% based on 2021 based year. So this is very challenging target for us for 2030. Next, please. So for us, let me explain about the green polymer. We actually have a four pillar. First of all, we call it a reduced pillar. This one, we produce plastic resin that have a superior performance. So when you use it to fabricate something, it uses less material or use less energy, we call it reduced. We have a technology platform called SMX. Pillar number two is a recyclable. And this one is more focused on the packaging. And we're doing a providing mono material solution for the sustainable packaging value chain. So this is part of the important ingredient for the green polymer. Third is the recycle. We are, as you know that the, right now the world is mostly moving in terms of the linear economy and to be able to do circular economy, recycle is important. So for us, very proud that we have both solution, mechanical recycle, and advanced recycle, which we can take the difficult to recycle waste plastic back to raw material again and start the polymerization so every, everything become full type cycle. And the last one is a renewable. This one we try to move away from fossil based placing and try to do the bio based raw material to make the plastic. And underlying everything, we, we provide the digital solution as a platform for circular economy. Next, please. So this is an example that the, in terms of circular economy, I think the partnership is very important. So this is an example that we work with the, in this part in Thailand, we work with Shell to put more PCR. PCR is a post-consumer resin. So we can put the 25% of high quality PCR that we make and bring it back to the this uh, loop bottle again. So this one is the green polymer has been certified by global recycle standard. And the other example that we show is on the circular PP that we made with advanced recycling technology. I think uh, if you can imagine, not all waste plastic is uh, can be easy recycled, especially 
to bring it back to the food contact application. So we develop advanced recycling that we technically make down the plastic to consist of molecule again and do starting polymerization. So this one we work with the partner to make the uh, kind of a cup for the jelly and for the for the for the fruit. So we have been certified ISCC plus in Thailand. I think we one of the first one. So this is the example of the green polymer that we work with the partner. Next slide. And then, I mean, there, there is no question that to make plastic take a lot of energy, take a lot of uh, raw material and generate a lot of CO2 in terms of our operation. So we have to try best to reduce the CO2 footprint. First of all, we always use the technology and digital and advancement of engineering to improve the energy efficiency. Second, we try to convert part of our usage of electricity from classical electrical power to renewable energy. And the next one is a low carbon thermal heat. For the heavy industry, it's very important that uh, you, you need a lot of proceed, proceed heat and it cannot provide by electricity because it's very high temperature, high load. So we have to have a low carbon fuel that we can use for the thermal heat. And then on the bottom of the, of the paragraph, renewable recycled raw material, this is one of the main direction. Try to chain away from fossil based raw material and you use renewable raw material. For example, we are, we are in the process of studying using the ethanol to ethylene and make ethylene to polyethylene so that it will be based on bio base. Or the thing that I talk about, the advanced recycle that we take the waste plastic as the raw material and then ch chain it back to monomer and polymerize again. Next one is about carbon capture and sequestration and utilization. I think this, this one is still very early stage for us and a lot of challenge. We still kind of working with the startup and small company to, to see what will be the, the right solution for the future. And for all of this, we still also working with the, I call it the carbon offset mechanism or natural based solution. So, in Thailand, we very much work closely with the like, people that uh, with the government in terms of replanting the mangrove because we think that mangrove is as very useful both carbon in terms of absorption and also provide the livelihoods for the small fisherman community because it's a mangrove is a place that is kind of a nursery for the small fish and, and seafood. Next, please. So in summary, we are in the process of trying to transform our company to be a sustainable chemical company. So we work, we're going to provide high quality recycled material and also in the future try to move away from fossil based as much as possible to bio-based material. And in the meantime, we try our best to get the greenhouse gas emission down from our operation to the using more renewable energy, more efficiency, and also to do more innovation so that we can use new technology to utilize less fossil fuel stock. So thank you very much to this uh, company in the nutshell in the space. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, if you have any questions for Surasha, please remember to use the Q&A tool at the the bottom of your screen. Now Dallas will present mining and the decarbonization journey to net zero. The floor is yours, Dallas. Thanks, Axel. And it's my pleasure to be here this, this evening um, to talk to this group around the challenges faced in the, the world to get to net zero by 2050, and particularly how mining will also uh, play a key role in that process. So first, a bit more about myself. I'm currently the chair of 3ME Technology which is an organization or company that's focused on electrification of heavy vehicles, in particular for the mining industry. I'm also the chair of the board for Ostmine, an industry association that represents some companies who provide technology and services to the mining industry. 
So I'm coming with that lens today of talking about a long history in mining and what we're doing around um, now moving towards this decarbonisation goal. But firstly, um, what is sorry, what is mining is what I'm going to cover today. What's the role with net zero and why mining is so important on this journey to actually achieve, achieve net zero by 2050, that we can't do that without mining. And I'm going to go through that today. So let's start with the basics, what's mining? I think that the, most people may get confused what mining really is. It's not just digging holes in the ground for the sake of digging holes in the ground. It's actually there to try and extract useful materials from the earth to be able to use them to advance society. And uh, that's why it's so important that we, uh, we understand mining in the, in the uh, current format. If you take, take your normal, your iPhone, um, that takes about 30 to 40 minerals to actually uh, make that and to uh, deliver this bit of technology. And that's just one of many that we use today. So in terms of the industry, some of the trends we've looked at in, in mining uh, recently that are moving through the industry and across the world, in fact, in many different industries, is looking at the environment issues. So we know about decarbonisation, carbon capture, the rehabilitation of mine sites after being, being mined. Um, energy is a big part of what mining is doing at the moment, looking at the efficiency of energy, adopting alternate fuels, and particular electrification of fleets and equipment, and transitioning to using a lot of green energy. Um, Digitalisation is another big part. That's all about data. And then, of course, automation robotics, a bit like you see in the automotive industry as well. And then, of course, the ESG aspects we heard a bit before from Zerusha around the side of it as well and plus the overall trend of geopolitics across the world. So that's what's influencing mining from a, a directional point of view. And so today the focus is really around the, the energy aspects of this and the decarbonisation to 2050. Now it's probably worth starting with the point that mining is pretty energy intensive and counts about 10% of the world consumption of energy. So mining um, obviously needs to also uh, become more efficient at um, energy use but then we'll also hear about how it can actually help to move in the transition and get to decarbonisation by 2050. So the slide I've got next is just looking up the value chain in mining. And I'm doing just from mining um, operational perspective. We start with, um, with exploration. The next part of it would be then drilling and blasting that mine, that ore body to be able to, to break the rock up and to be able to then move that through a load and haul cycle into what's called a crushing cycle and then to processing where the, the minerals are extracted. And you can see here all those aspects that have a lot of energy involved in doing that, particularly if you look at it um, from crushing. Crushing is the, uh, probably the most intensive in that area. So the best place to actually break the rock mean efficiency is actually in the ground with explosives. And so that's what we're starting in here on the left-hand side. So what we're trying to do now to make our energy use is quite efficient is first of all, find the right ore bodies where we can extract the uh, minerals at uh, higher grades in the right locations so maybe less transport required to get to the, uh, the wharfs and the, the, the ports to get them off overseas. And then understanding a lot about geology. The more you understand about the geology that you're digging in the mine, then it's much easier to, in terms of energy usage. For drill and blast cycle, we're looking at the drill efficiency. So um, drilling the holes in the right place and using, drilling it once, not twice, like for example, planning the blasting, looking at the products of blasting, particularly those that produce nitrous oxides and eliminating nitrous oxides, reducing that, um, which of course is a greenhouse uh, impact. And then um, also eliminating waste in that process. When we talk about load and haul, we're looking at more efficient loading, loading of the trucks. If you see the bottom right hand picture, that's a 350 tonne uh, truck that hauls material up a mine into a, a processing plant. So it's quite a energy intensive going up a ramp. Now, if you think about some of the changes going in the industry, a lot of organisations think about what they call swarm theory, potentially using smaller trucks to replace the big ones. Because when you move through and think about the future of electrification, having a large truck going on a big slope, it takes a lot of energy. But you take many small trucks up and actually do it more energy efficiently. So that's one example of innovations coming into to play in the energy, the energy sphere. Um, so designs of mine come important in the, um, in the electrification and decarbonisation process to be more energy efficient. The size of the trucks I've talked about and just more efficient loading the vehicles. Moving into the crushing, we look at the, um, the size of the crusher, we look at the methods for crushing and of course the waste side as well. We don't want to crush ore that's got, that's got no, no, um, no, no uh, valuable mineral in there at all. We don't want to get do that at all. We want to put that, eliminate that to the side. And of course, for processing, we're looking at um, better chemicals to extract the minerals, such as the gold or the 
electronics we're getting out of it to be more efficient there. And so plant design comes very important to get a higher yields and get less waste. Now, overlaying all of this is an important thing that's coming to all industries at the moment where I'm looking at the, the data process. So data becomes knowledge, becomes wisdom in this area using a lot of sensors to actually pick up the data across a mine site and then eventually using artificial intelligence and systems thinking to develop much more efficient processes to uh, be able to minimise the, the energy required. So things like digital twins now coming very important in, in trialling stuff before you go out and trial at an actual mine. And of course, measurement is uh, really important as well. So that gives you know, an understanding of the sorts of things we're talking about now that we're moving through the mine industry to reduce that 10% of energy demand across the world but also to ensure that it becomes more efficient and can deliver the minerals we need to be able to move to the next step. So looking then at the, um, the, uh, the progress we've made, a number of mines now are moving to become diesel free and using, um, natural, and using energies in a, in a neutral position. So for example, the pictures on the right-hand side shows a massive solar panel um, array that's used to support the mine to uh, with energy demands or the top mine, wind, wind farms that are also using, using some of the mines. So designing mines now from the start around making sure they're energy efficient, looking at the whole value chain. We've, um, we've moved from having a, a really important focus over the years on safety, which is still, of course, important in any, any industry, but moving now to the platform of um, energy efficiency. We're seeing hydrogen trucks coming into play. Uh, that'll be happening in 2025 and beyond. Solar and wind energy playing an important role, but biodiesel, hydropower, and geothermal. As I've talked before, electric vehicles are now coming quickly available and being moving into the mining sphere. So as I mentioned before, um, 3 me technology um, has been doing a lot of work um, with its uh, patented technology to get loaders like the one on the top right-hand side, a 20-ton loader, to electrified. And that's a very big step forward in the industry. We'll move all diesel. And in fact, the feedback's been quite amazing because it removes, it means people can hear each other around the vehicle and also don't get any associated issues with diesel fumes in the environment they're working in. That's just an example of sorts of technology that's coming through and there's a lot of technology tied up in electrification of vehicles. If we um, look at the other roles that mining plays in energy transition, we, we know that to get the, the new green energy, we need to get critical minerals to do that. So the battery power requires a lot of different minerals. And you'll see at the bottom of the screen, I've mentioned a couple in there, lithium, copper, cobalt, nickel, and rare earth. So just some of those that we need to have to not just manufacture batteries, but also for the wind farms and all the other types of uh, energies that are being required to be able to meet the net zero 2050. We then move quickly into uh, looking at what the work on forum is talking about here. They're obviously uh, appreciating that we need to now have a very big change in the, the technology base for to be able to extract these new minerals and metals we need to have. And the mining sector, of course, has got to catch up to that. There's a very big demand coming. The, um, the calculation is there's an unprecedented demand of over 3 billion tonnes of material that's needed to be able to transition to clean energy. And so if you look at that, it provides six times the amount of minerals required by 2040 to make 2050 uh, targets. So this transformation in mining is pretty urgent and it's also required to, to do that in an in a, um, efficient way for not just energy, but water and environmental intensity. So we're seeing a lot of global startup um, start coming into play uh, a role in bridging the innovation gap required to deliver this technology. Now, just what's the dimensions on that. Um, if you look at this next slide here, the top slide just shows you electric vehicle versus a conventional car and how many minerals are now required electric vehicle to be able to efficiently develop, develop that vehicle. Most of the course is sitting here around, uh, you've got graphite, you've got um, nickel, lithium, copper, and copper demand is going up by a factor, I think it's eight to 10 times from the current car. Um, and just noting here that one megawatt of power is a thousand kilowatts, of course, and that's what we required to run about 2000 homes for about one hour. So there's a lot of demand here. And the test, the bottle three, for example, is 62 kilowatts. The loader I showed you before was 150 kilowatts. Now, if you look at them, what that means in kilograms um, in terms of the, across the different types of um, energies, wind energy, you see it's got a lot of demand here for, um, for the materials, same as through um, on, uh, solar panels, particularly around silicon. And then you've got the other types here that require a lot of um, minerals to get there. Looking at what that means now in terms of mining space over the next uh, few years, you can see the demand from lithium is going from almost nothing in 2010 to really huge amount, almost 100% uh, increase over the, the lifetime in 2050, or 
The same thing you see for cobalt, massive demand increase. The same for nickel, for copper, and of course for rare earths. Rare earths being used in a lot of the motors that drive the, uh, the windmills, for example. Okay, so then moving to um, what we're seeing in the revolution for mining, energy is a key focus on the, the change. We're getting new companies joining the mining industry to bring in new technologies. Business models are changing and collaboration is coming really important to be able to release that technology to be able to deliver the value we need to get to the 2050 targets. We've seen a lot of merger and acquisition um, activity and commercialization of new technologies is rapid, rapid and it's um, changing very, very quickly to uh, one or two years and technology is um, almost redundant and moving on from there. Moving then on to the next slide, we see some cases on licensing for IP. Now, I won't cover that today, but uh, just catching here, coming here on these collaboration aspects here. There's uh, roles that trade secret plays. There's um, disruptive services, how you actually license with that. And of course, the role of software. And it's important to think about aggregation of, of IP to make uh, a solution. And that then moves to be able to be licensed to an organization or licensed in or licensed out to organizations. So just um, moving then to summarise, the mining industry is a key part of the energy transition, particularly in supply of critical minerals that's required for the alternate energies we need to make uh, net zero 2050 and decarbonise the world. The industry has strong demand for energy and it's um, looking at very strong focus now on energy efficiencies across the, all the mining operations. And the future demand will be around management technologies, not just one technology, covering a lot of different energies. We'll be running mine sites around hydrogen, electric, solar, wind, for example. So this transition is underway. It's a critical neighbour of success for delivery of 2050. And uh, I look forward to um, discussing that with you the Q&A shortly. And uh, back to you, Axel. Thank you, Dallas. I hope that you know, it will provide uh, information to people and having a different um, understanding of what mining is uh, and how it would contribute to net zero emissions. Uh, now, uh, I would like to, to make sure that if people have any questions, please use the Q&A tool, okay, again. And um, now um, the floor is for Stephanie, who will present the transformative role of 5G. Hi, uh, and it, it's really a pleasure to be uh, part of this panel and discuss how technology can help achieve net zero emissions. Um, so let me just say a few words about Qualcomm and 5G. So Qualcomm is the world uh, leading wireless innovator. Uh, <clears throat> <coughs> sorry, sorry for that. And uh, so you won't be surprised that I'm focusing my, my presentation of uh, the, this transformative role of, of 5G. And uh, let me explain a bit more what 5G is and why it's uh, such an important technology. And, and the way to think about it is think about the, the previous wireless generations. So the 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, um, 5G is completely different. So 5G is not only about smartphones. It's not only about connecting people. It's about connecting everything everywhere. So device, homes, machines, cars, uh, <clears throat> everything you can think of. So 5G is kind of becoming this underlying infrastructure in, in our connected world. And as a result, it really has the power to unlock the potential of other technologies that we hear a lot about, like AI, edge compute, internet of things. <clears throat> and it has application in, in many sectors of, of, of the economy. So on 5G and sustainability in particular, our team at Qualcomm uh, has published a report last year on the sustainability benefits of 5G. And that's what I'm gonna use for this presentation today. So in this report, we make the point that there are two ways by which 5G is contributing to sustainability. First, uh, the first set of impact is via the enabled sustainab sustainability benefits from the application of 5G. That so like, for instance, uh, it's great that Dallas was making this presentation just before Dallas mentioned, you know, the role of sensors, digitization, um, IoT in the mining sector. So this is enabled technology uh, thanks to 5G. The other set of effects, they come from the technology. Stephanie, technology. sorry to yes. interrupt. It yes. seems that your slides are not moving. That no, yeah, no. yeah, it's on purpose. They're gonna be moving soon, don't worry. Okay, uh, this thank is you. the introduction, and then I'm going to be moving that. Uh, sorry. 
Uh, and so the second set of impacts, these are the impacts that are more linked to the uh, in technologic improvement in, in wireless technology. So 5G is much more efficient and environmental friendly than the previous generation, so than 3G and 4G. So now I'm going to move the slides. OK. Um, and so that's, uh, that's kind of an overview of the applications enabled by, by 5G. So when, when we did this study last year, <clears throat> we found that, for instance, uh, when um, fully integrated, and this is focusing on the US, by the way, but we trust that it could be applied to other regions also. But so once 5G is fully rolled out in the different industries in the US, we estimated that it could reduce greenhouse gas emission by 370 million metric tons uh, avoided in 2025. So that's about 6% of the US emissions. And it's the equivalent of taking 81 million vehicles off the road for one year in the US. And just on this one, I'm going to switch one slide and then I'll go back. Uh, <clears throat> this is kind of the overview of. <coughs> <laughs> where these uh, emission reductions are coming from. And you can see that it's shared across the different sectors of the economy, um, like transportation, manufacturing, agriculture, energy. We don't have mining here because it's, I think it's smaller, but uh, it's also part of the picture. And uh, as you can see, it affects all economic sectors and many of our day-to-day uh, -day life with smart transportation or smart living and things like that. Um, if I go back to the previous slide, I'm going to tell you a bit more about the, this effect. So uh, we found, for instance, that um, smart water systems enabled by 5G can save over 400 billion gallons of water world nationwide in the US. So that's the water usage of about 4 million households. We also found that if using drones and remote sensing in agriculture, you can reduce pesticide use by 50%. Um, thinking about transportation, you could get 20% reduction in energy consumption, either <clears throat> through connected cars that are using uh, lane management systems and traffic management systems, systems, and this is a technology uh, that we call CV2X, and it consists, consists in connecting cars to other cars, but also to the infrastructure and pedestrians. Um, and the, you have also um, <coughs> about 20% reduction uh, through automated trains of carriage. Uh, last, but also very important, I mean, not only the enable application of 5G are sustainable, but they also have a positive economic impact. Uh, for instance, we estimated that uh, it could create up to uh, 300,000 new green jobs in the US economy, like data scientists, data engineers, um, people working in energy sectors, smart, smart grids, uh, and so on. So now let's move to the second part of the presentation, which is like, <clears throat> you know, um, 5G networks are more energy efficient than previous networks. And I'm not an engineer, so I'm going to try to give you a quick non-technical overview of the many technical enhancements uh, that our 5G design engineers are, are worked on. And um, I mean, the <clears throat> this work has, made 5G networks much more efficient through the design of the 5G standards and the technology specifications. So the main idea is that the 5G signal is streamlined and therefore it's much more energy efficient. So for instance, uh, you don't need to have always on signal in transmission and you can also with 5G simplify the signaling function um, like mobility and over location management and this is reducing the overall traffic that you're gonna need in terms of data and therefore improve efficiency. So we have a kind of a <clears throat> list of, of this impact on the 
left hand side, I'm not going to go through all of them, but uh, so there are some important ones like what we call beam forming. So beam forming uh, reduces interference and focuses the signal in the direction of the user. So think of it as the difference between using a flashlight in a dark room where you know everyone is going to be in the light um, versus using just a light laser pointer that is going to be able to pinpoint to one specific point and then track the user um, <clears throat> with a much more focused light. So that's the same. We do the same thing with uh, the 5G signal. You also have device to device communication. So basically it means that device can communicate with each other without having to go back through the network and the base station. And this is really uh, energy saving. Uh, one key example is, again, the CB2X connected car technology where the vehicle can communicate directly with each other without having to uh, go back to the network. There are also some applications like infrastructure sharing, <coughs> where you can either share the physical equipment, the towers, for instance, or active sharing where you can share the network. And in both cases, uh, this is resulting in uh, energy and emission savings. Um, so just to conclude, I'm gonna go to the next slide where you know uh, the overall message on, on 5G is that 5G really has the potential to impact every industry uh, by creating new products and processes that are supporting environmental sustainability and also, this is a technology that by itself is more energy efficient. Um, so overall, uh, this is creating tremendous opportunity of, in the different economic sectors. Uh, and it has the, um, the potential of increasing you know, competitiveness of the, the companies that, that are deploying it. So you gain both in terms of sustainability and also in terms of, of economic growth. And um, thank you, I'm gonna stop here. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, I'm pretty sure that now, you know, we have a, a few questions to start with. So I invite, I see that Dallas joined us again, Sarasha uh, as well. Uh, so please do not forget to use the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. And we will start with a first question for Sarasha, which is uh, what is, what exactly is green polymer made of? And is green polymer as strong and durable as traditional plastic? Yes, yes. I think uh, for us, when we talk about green solution, we not compromise on the performance of the end product. So it means that in terms of functionality, it has to serve the, the same purpose. For us, it's more like, can we using the waste as a raw material to make it back to the plastic again. So this is what the thing that we, we focus. Or can we make the plastic resin that we can put more recycle in it so that when when you make something like the like the bottle, you can use less virgin. So this is a thing that we call green polymer. So we have four pillars. So we're not inventing the new polymer. We just try to make the same polymer better. Make it from waste, make it from bio-based material, or make the make the virgin polymer that we can put more recycle blend together and we save the raw material. Okay. Thank you. Sounds sounds good. Um, a question for you, Stephanie. In your presentation, you mentioned how connected car technology can help reduce emission. Uh, could you please tell us a bit more um, how the technology is expected to, to impact? Yeah, sure. And, and just as a, for context, uh, globally, passenger vehicles account for close to 10% of the CO2 emissions. Uh, so there is a huge potential there to to reduce emission. And so that, that the good news is that now we've connected cars, um, 
you can re we can really contribute to reducing these emissions. Um, so it's um, so this connected car technology enables the vehicles to connect with each other and with everything around them. So pedestrian infrastructure, um, the cellular network. So I'm going to give you a few examples of how this uh, connected vehicle technology can help reduce emissions. So for instance, um, one of the application is what we call green light optimal speed advisory. So basically you are providing the driver with information on whether the lights is gonna be green or red um, by the time they arrive to the traffic lights, which helps you know, target your speed and uh, it gives uh, indication to the driver whether they should go faster, slower. Um, and this is this has been proven to reduce emissions. Uh, for, you have also like um, eco routing where you are suggesting the car to use the best route given, um, you know, the best route in terms of reducing emissions given the current traffic, the road conditions, whether there is an accident. Uh, you have also ma many applications that are gonna help like kind of speed harmonization. So you are giving advice to the people on the speed they should go at, and you're also trying to help them with lane management. Uh, <clears throat> and it's very important because, I mean, it reduces the emissions what you are driving. It's also, it's also a technology that can help reduce car accidents. So the first benefit, of course, is to reduce car accident injuries and fatalities that are very high, uh, including in the US. But also, if you can avoid having accident, it means that you're going to be able to avoid uh, congestion. And if you avoid congestion, you're also going to be able to reduce emissions. So and that, that's a very powerful technology, both in terms of you know, reducing carbon emissions, but with also some very great uh, benefits in terms of reducing uh, road accidents. OK, thank you. And Dallas, I just, I was, uh, you I just might add, oh, sorry. I want to add to that for a minute as well, because Stephanie, there's a really good application in mining, particularly in the automation of haul trucks, and comes very efficient and need the 5G to, to connect all the haul trucks together. And I know organisations running 40, 50 autom autonomous of vehicles that are hauling, say, 10, 20 kilometres from a, a pit to a crushing plant. And that interconnectivity is really, really important in getting efficient use of their, their vehicles. So it cuts back the, uh, in the energy use quite a lot by what you've talked about. So some great examples through mining, both underground and open cut mining. Uh, you were faster than me. Uh, so let, let me reformulate one of the questions. Uh, Dallas, you talked about collaboration. So this is linked to this, uh, but how collaboration is becoming more important? Uh, in the, in mining. Do you have any examples or illustrations? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think the mining industry recognises they can't actually solve their problems on their own. We need to get industries bringing other new technologies into it. And so the collaboration comes really, really important, particularly when you think about uh, the interconnectivity we just had a minute ago from Stephanie. You need to have uh, software companies, um, hardware companies that do electronics. You need to have um, battery companies, for example, coming in that might be in other industries. A lot of it coming, say, out of automotion, automation, could be coming in the space industry or coming in the military industry, or agriculture. They're all coming together to now find a unique solution because it's quite cost to develop new technology. So collaboration now is about getting that technology fast to market and therefore you need to be able to um, work together where you haven't got the skills, you're bringing new skills to other companies and then collaborate to get that outcome you're after. Now, a great example of this is a, um, a challenge that... Ostmine put out a few years ago on behalf of the mining companies and particularly BHP, Rio Tinto and Vale and plus another 18 mining companies. For the first time ever I've ever seen in my career, they worked together to challenge the industry to help electrify the huge haul trucks, the large haul trucks. And that went through um, a process where 350 companies applied for that and it came down to a short list of eight companies in the end who are now working together to help electrify those large haul trucks in a collaboration effect. And that would never have happened 20, 30 years ago. Each company worked on their own for their own technology. But as industry, the mining community came together in those big companies and then started to look at different ways of solving their problems in a faster way because they recognise speed is important. 2050 is coming pretty quickly in terms of the technology uh, enablement. So we need to get there quickly by doing lots of collaboration and being more efficient. Okay. 
Uh, then the following question is, uh, I think Suresha and Dallas, you talked about carbon capture and carbon capture sequ uh, sequestration. Uh, I'm not sure that everybody is very familiar with uh, this, um, this technology. So uh, could one of you, or maybe both of you could try to, to explain what is carbon capture sequest uh, sequestration? I might if you can start if you want to, and then that's where you can pick next piece up from your side. So, um, certainly in the mining space, um, there's a lot of effort going in right now in trying to work out how to capture CO2 coming out of operations, and particularly power stations is a good example that generate CO2. What you're doing, you're taking that, that gas coming off and converting that into a useful product. And one way you can do this through some mineral carbonation routes where you take that CO2 and you carbonate that with various minerals to make maybe a carbonate product, which could be a briquette. So I know there's projects running in Australia in some of the R&D spaces and some large organisations such as Orica who are working with taking that, that product into making it with into a briquette to be going to houses. So the CO2 comes from stopping a gas to being locked up in a, in a solid form. And that's what we talk about in terms of that side of it. The other way to sequest um, CO2 in, in a lot of the industries is you, you're putting it down into into the gas wells that are no longer used. So you're also pushing it under pressure into the ground as well. That's another way of um, capturing carbon and moving it through. So Risha, you got any comments you'd like to add? Yes, I think uh, for us, I mean, carbon capture and put it on the ground, in the ground is one thing, but I think a lot of people in the industry looking for it as a kind of new raw material. So can we capture CO2 and do mm. the, fancy chemical work reaction and make it to something useful. But I think the grand challenge for the, for the industry and everyone is uh, CO2 has only carbon and oxygen. And most of the thing that, that we use in the world is organic material. You need hydrogen in part of the molecule. So where can we get the hydrogen to react effectively with carbon dioxide? I think this is a, uh, very much a mm. grand challenge. In terms of capturing CO2 is from the full gas or the stack. I think is the, there is a known chemistry that you can do amine adsorption and things like that, that you can capture CO2. But then uh, you want to make it into, for example, like plastic again, but you need hydrogen to make reaction. Then where the hydrogen, because the hydrogen is uh, in terms of chemistry, is everywhere and also not everywhere because it's uh, not freely available in, in the space, in the air. It's, it's in the form of water or other thing that you have to separate it out and make it to the element hydrogen and reaction with carbon dioxide. So this is this where the, where the innovation is going on, where the grand challenge that, that everyone trying to crack this problem. I think I might just add another comment to for my Axel is that it's um, certainly a long way to go in this um, technology yet because one of the things you've got to think about is to make sure it's, it's energy neutral or less or negative as opposed to adding, taking more energy to make the conversion. So that's also the challenge for the chemists uh, to actually help us uh, get that energy equation right. So you don't want to be doing carbon capture, but it costs you more energy because that's what you don't want to be doing in the environment as well. So there's a bit of a way to go yet, but there's a, a lot of effort going into it. And I think it is a, a really important part of that structure what about making the, the products you can use out of it as well. Okay. Um, now switching gear, maybe that's for, for Stephanie. So uh, my understanding is 5G is being rolled out over the world, uh, not at the same speed everywhere, but at least we can consider that what I'm, I'm learning is, uh, you know, uh, in Asia and lately in India, 5G was less, just launched maybe last month or the last few months. Uh, what is needed now for the benefits from 5G to fully materialize, in your opinion? You're muted. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, I think what, what's very important is to continue to, to deploy the, the 5G networks and, and also to deploy the technology through, through the different industries. And, you know, I think Dallas was giving a, a great example of how, you know, 5G can help um, improving efficiency and reducing emissions in, in the mining sector. But think of it in, okay, 
applying to all the sectors of the economy, like you can apply, you can apply in mining, then you're going to apply it in the transportation of the minerals to the factory, you're going to apply it in manufacturing, then you're going to apply it in logistics and transport. And so you can get some efficiency gains, but also some carbon saving through the whole supply chain. So that, that's really something that that is key. So it has to be continued to be deployed. And, and these gains uh, that you're going to get, you can't get them with the previous technology. If you think of having all these connected sensors, uh, whether it's on the mine or in the agricultural sector, you really need the power of 5G to get there. So the first thing is very important to continue the deployment of, of the technology the, in all the sectors of the economy. The other thing for, for us as uh, the technology developer, I mean, we, we need to continue working with the ecosystem and we're gonna keep our focus on, you know, um, making sure that as we continue to innovate, the technology becomes even more uh, energy efficient. So that's, that's something we are working on and um, we need to make sure that, you know, we promote this innovation that can lower the energy use uh, that uh, comes with the with, with 5G and also that we <coughs> uh, we can reduce you know the the material use uh, as as we develop the the new product. Uh, what's also very important is for government and the industries to work together so that to facilitate and and accelerate the, the use cases. And what's also very important is to get the, the workforce uh, that can help develop you know, all this innovation, whether it's in the, the different sectors of the economy or whether it's developing the technology itself. So we need to continue you know, um, fostering a STEM programs in universities and different training and so, so that uh, we are able to to continue developing the, the technology. So 5G is like the enabler, uh, allowing yes. many, a, a diversity of clients yes. to create their own services, leveraging 5G yes. technologies. Yes, but so it's the enabler. So that's one thing. And I, I, but it's also a technology that is more efficient than the previous one. So you get, you get, you know, two positive effects with, with one technology. Mm. It's more efficient by itself and it's enabling uh, efficient applications. Well, okay. I think so I good. fully agree that we won't get we won't get net zero if you're talking about 5G without those either the 6G or we've gone beyond that because the data management is really important to get the efficiency we need to get a 2050 zero. And Dallas, uh, in your presentation, you you put on hold more or less uh, the impact to licensing and IP. Um, and so the, then the question is, to expand further on, the, on this specific item, um, what about licensing and IP, what they would bring to the mining world, in your opinion? Oh, that's a good question because it's, it's, it's a lot. And I'm just going to bring that slide up a bit more now. Too. So what we talk about with the licensing side, there's a whole lot of, um, we've got to license in new technology from other industries. And it's important to keep the licensing top of your mind because someone's paid for that research. I saw a note in the minute ago in the Q&A about who's funding this, and it's funding by the big organisations who have to drive to get the change because, they're first of all, their shareholders demand it, they demand it from the ESG point of view, and governments are demanding it. And so we've got to bring in a whole lot of new technologies from other industries. So you're licensing that technology, you're aggregating it together, and you're making new solutions out of it. And so, therefore, um, that is a, a different solution that's happened in the past. And so you also lost that back to other industries as well. So you're using those solutions to go right across the board industries. And Stephanie's touched on the stuff today around the importance of 5G there. That's going to be an enabler in those technologies coming together to collect the data to be able to deliver the value in the longer term. So we're seeing um, the role of IT in the things, which is what Stephanie was talking about, data and software coming important. We're seeing um, the, the business models now changing. And so it might be, I'm not going to lie, I'm not going to patent stuff maybe 20 years. I'll go for a trade sec for two years maximize the value out of that for two years and go to the next generation technology, then go again. And then there'll be different technologies coming in to enhance that, that base technology to get a better solution. We've seen geographic aspects of that coming in as well. 
you know, for example, Africa versus Latin America versus Europe versus Asia, there are different ways of running those technologies as well. There are barriers to it as well through the technology that you can apply in say cold climate or hot climate or underground versus open cut. There are many different ways you can look at this. So collaboration is exactly the key and the licensing implications are huge. I probably haven't done as a detailed discussion what you want because of the time, but um, that gives a flavour of the sorts of things we're talking about. Very good. Um, Suresha, I have one as a question for you, which is related to um, the new organic materials, because we talk a lot about substitute to plastic. And then people say, yeah, you have new organic materials. What do you think about this? Uh, should this be the way forward, um, replacing plastic with organic materials? I think... Uh... Most people may think that plastic is like paper. I mean, paper is paper, but plastic is actually many type of plastic and many different kind of chemistry of, of plastic. We have polyolefin, we have polyvinyl chloride, we have polycarbonate. So they all you call plastic, but actually they are all different. So to have, and the, the volume that we're talking about in the world for the every plastic, I think each year is like probably 200 million tons. So it means that it's unlikely that you can find a new class of polymer that can cover everything, right? So it means that for the new organic molecule to do all the job probably is not going to happening. But I think for certain application, maybe there's some new molecule that need to be invented. Because for example, in the past, we never have to think about end of life much. So for certain polymer that we decide is, uh, is, is we didn't take into account how to, how to make the end game. So those kind of application, maybe you need a new polymer. But for example, like if you do something like infrastructure, like pipe, I think you want to put the, the pipe last forever if you can do. So I think the current plastic do the job and you don't need to rein, reinvent the, the new molecule, I think. Okay. So there is so there's more machine. silver bullet for, for one plastic to solve 200 million ton problem a year of plastic. Yeah, so that's oversimplistic to believe that plastic is just plastic. Uh, you have yes. many different types of plastic. And every day we are using different type of plastic. Um, yeah. So clearly just replacing is not going to make it. Um, okay, you know, I, I think I have learned a lot and I would like to, to thank you all, especially because uh, just for the audience, uh, Suresha is based in Thailand and Dallas is in Singapore. And uh, Stephanie, yeah, and, and Stephanie is on the West Coast of the US. So uh, we are really uh, having a global webinar today. Thank you, because I know that the timing is not that ideal for all of you. Um, so before concluding, I would like to thank you again uh, for preparing this webinar and also all the audience for attending this webinar. Later today, you will receive an email inviting you to complete a one minute survey. And we would appreciate if you can just uh, provide your, your feedback and your ideas for the next, uh, for, for the, the next uh, topics. And uh, please don't forget to subscribe to the newsletter of 4IP where you will receive the next events and also visiting the LESI website. Uh, the next webinar will be on the 26th of January and that will be totally different from today, but still uh, the title will be who Owns Your Ink? The Copyright Protection of Tattoos with Dr. Paola Westenberger, who is uh, an expert in trademark and copyright and will explain everything that you want to learn about tattoos. Okay, so now that's time to, to conclude. Thank you again very much to all of you. And I wish you to have a great night, end of the night and a great day. <laughs>